then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion with a question from the public. And, and yeah, I'm going to work that. All right, so everyone, let's welcome Michael Clifford. Thank you so much for having me. It's really good to be back at Imperial. Um, I, don't, um, I don't like to pick favourites, but I think Imperial is probably my favourite university in the UK in terms of producing fantastic founders. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, tonight about what makes a great founder, and maybe that will reveal a little bit about why I think Imperial is so good at it. Um, we have funded many Imperial educated founders over the last three years at EAP. And uh, it's always fun to be back here uh, uh, meeting new and hopefully future founders. Um, so uh, Lorenzo is right. I want to talk about tonight uh, a topic that I think it sometimes gets kind of a little bit bullshitty and people like say things that I just don't think are true. And I want to tell you how we see the world at EF about really answering the question, what should you be doing now while you're still studying? here at Imperial if you want to be a great founder, if you want to be a fundable founder by the time you leave. Um, and like I said, there's three ways I actually upgraded you while I wrote this talk. There's three and a half ways tonight, so um, look forward to the bonus uh, 0.5 uh, right at the end. Um, I'm going to say right up front, the word fundable here uh, really is shorthand for like viable as a business. I'm not necessarily saying that everyone should go out and raise money from investors and I'm not really going to talk about how to raise money from investors. When I say ways to be a fundable founder, what I really mean is how do you get to the point such that when you graduate, you're in a position that you can actually start something that is really exciting, really viable, and that has potentially very high impact. So, um, quick show of hands, who has ever heard of Entrepreneur First before we act before? All right, cool. Not everyone. So I'll give a quick um, overview of what it is. Uh, what is Entrepreneur First? Entrepreneur First is a company that I started three and a half years ago uh, with my friend Alice. Alice and I, um, uh, when we graduated, uh, we went to work at a company called McKinsey, which is a management consultancy. And uh, there were some good things about it, uh, but it certainly wasn't a great preparation for starting a company. And we spent a long time after we left McKinsey unlearning a lot of the things we'd learned at McKinsey. And one of the reasons we built Entrepreneur First is that we wanted to create the best possible platform for people who want to build meaningful, scalable businesses towards the start of their careers. And that's exactly what EF does. We are a program, a company, that wants to support the most ambitious, uh, mainly tech grads, to become entrepreneurs when they graduate, when they leave university. Um, when we started EF, we had a few twists on the traditional accelerator model um, that we thought were really important for the UK ecosystem. We thought were really important to fit where London and UK and Europe actually more generally was in relation to startups. And I have to say, some of these twists made people think that it was a really stupid idea. Alice and I could not raise money for Entrepreneur First when we started. No one would give us any money. We had to put everything on our credit cards. And the reason was that we were proposing to do two things that seemed really radical at the time. The first thing was we said we were going to support people before they had a team. And in, in venture capital, in the world of entrepreneurship, in general, people are really want to invest in teams. And the second thing that we said was that when we selected people to join EF, we weren't going to judge them based on their ideas. We weren't going to select on how good or viable a business idea it was. We were just going to select on the basis of how talented the actual founder was. Um, people thought this was pretty stupid. Uh, unfortunately, they were wrong. Um, three years on, we've built 20 companies at EF that have graduated. They're worth about $100 million. Uh, we have another 20 with us now that will graduate in three weeks, which I find a mixture of exciting and terrifying, and I hope they will help us at least double this number this year. We really focus at EF on building businesses that can have genuinely global impact. Um, we don't think there's anything wrong with people who have smaller ambitions than that. We don't think there's anything wrong with businesses that have smaller ambitious, uh, ambitions than that. But that's not what we're trying to do at EF. At EF, what we're really interested in doing is funding people who have 
ambition to really change the world in some dimension. We want to do stuff that people will talk about. We want to push boundaries. We want people who essentially look at the world and see it as a, as a blank canvas on which they can write. Uh, and where that's really pushed us over the last three years is, is down a, a track towards uh, investing in very cutting edge technology companies. Um, to give you an example of some of the things we're working on this year, we've just funded companies in the last six months working in very diverse fields from artificial intelligence to virtual reality to Bitcoin to video compression to financial technology. We've got, we've got a drones company, we've got a robotics company. We're really interested in doing things that seem very, very early in the phase of development now, but one day could have a truly outsized impact on the world. So we feel we've learned an awful lot in the last three years about how to build great companies. Some of the companies that are in the portfolio are now growing extremely quickly. Uh, one of them I found out a couple of weeks ago just hit the three million dollars of revenue a month mark. And it's crazy to think that two years ago when we first met those guys, they had no idea what they were going to build and no idea um, how to make money. So we feel we've learned a lot about what to do, but equally we feel we've learned an awful lot about what not to do. And actually I sometimes think that one of the biggest things that EAC provides is just uh, a ton of advice about how to avoid the most common mistakes in startups. So I want to talk first about how not to be fundable. Um, what I'm really trying to get at tonight is, if you were to say, I have a year before you know, I have to go out into the world and do something, whether that's taking a job or starting a company, if you want to go down that entrepreneurial path, what is it that you would do to be ready? I think there's a lot of misconceptions about this, as I said at the start. And so I want to start with three ways that I think people think they should prepare for entrepreneurship or startup life that are actually wrong, or at least seem to be wrong in our experience. So the first of these I say here is, I don't think you need to be the perfect job candidate in order to get in to a position where you can build a fundable business. Um, I know that when I applied to work at McKinsey, I had one of those CVs that now I would slightly recoil from if deciding whether to fund someone here. You know, I'd kind of been president of all the right societies, I'd got all the right grades, I'd done all the right things to get a job. But actually, although those things indicate that someone is hardworking or determined, potentially even intelligent, that is not what actually determines winners and losers in the startup world. When we started the app, we were convinced that if we just found the smartest people, everything else would follow. And actually, that's turned out not to be true. We definitely do want smart people at EF. But what we've seen over the years is actually when we compare the people who've been our most successful founders from the one, to the ones who have not done so well, actually, the ones who've been most successful tend to have had slightly unconventional backgrounds in some way. <coughs> I don't mean that they're not smart or they didn't go to great unis. In fact, we've funded tons of people from Imperial, from Cambridge, Oxford, Edinburgh, traditionally great unions. But I don't want anyone to think that you, know, you need the same CV to get into, I don't know, Goldman Sachs or Google as you do to be a great founder. I think actually being the perfect job candidate on its own, this obviously doesn't disqualify you, lots of, lots of great founders do have great CVs, but that is not the thing to optimize for if what you really care about is starting a company. I'll go on to talk a bit more about that. But that's the first thing. You don't need to be the perfect job candidate to be a great founder. The second thing that you can't really be, which is what university I think sometimes prepares you for, is you can't really be a smart generalist. What do I mean by a smart generalist? I mean, if you are the sort of person who can turn your hand to anything and kind of be pretty good at it, that's a great characteristic to have for life. But it's not necessarily the sign of a great founder. I think a lot of the time we talk in very um, respectful terms about people who are very well-rounded, very well-adjusted. You know, they can turn their hand to anything. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's probably how you'd have described me and Alice if you met us when we left university. But again, when I look at the people who we've funded who've done exceptionally well, I don't think they were generalists. 
they weren't actually people who you could say, oh, they don't really have any obvious weaknesses. They're a good all-rounder. Instead, what we've seen at EF is that actually the people who have done best, people who start the most successful companies, often have very profound and very obvious weaknesses. There's usually something where you can say, oh my god, that is really worrying. There's something about this person that just you would never want to employ this person. We often think it's a really good sign if we meet someone who we know would never get a job at McKinsey. Oh, thank God. Um, I don't want to seem facetious. I, um, we've actually funded people before who've left McKinsey, and they've done very well. But what I'm getting at here is that don't, a lot of the time, people think that the best way to improve your prospects in life is to look at what you're weakest at and pull that characteristic up to at least the average level of your other characteristics. And people often think that that's really, that's the best way for self-improvement. In my experience, that's not true of founders. Founders do far, far better when they have something at which they're truly exceptional, even if that's offset by weaknesses in other areas, than they do if they're merely very good at everything. And again, when it comes to the flip side of this, I'll talk about that in more detail. I was, the second piece of advice is, don't worry too much about being a smart generalist. Don't worry too much about your weaknesses. <clears throat> the third thing, and maybe this is the wrong audience to say this to, but the third thing that does not make great founders are people who are expert entrepreneurs. It is almost impossible to be an expert entrepreneur. Um, in fact, I would argue that of all the things you could be expert at before starting a company, being an expert entrepreneur is probably the very worst thing to be expert at. What do I mean by an expert entrepreneur? I guess what I mean by this is there is this whole culture around startups and entrepreneurship which is kind of somewhat cheerleading for the very idea of entrepreneurship. It's like, we, yay, entrepreneurs, everyone should be an entrepreneur. Wouldn't it be great if everyone was an entrepreneur? I think that's actually total bullshit. Um, entrepreneurship isn't really a general thing that you can be good at. At least it's not a thing that you can be good at in a general sense that is so powerful and sufficient that it offsets not being an expert in anything else. I'm not saying you shouldn't read blog posts about entrepreneurship. I'm not saying don't go read the lean startup <coughs> zero to one or the hard thing about hard things or all these books that have become very popular within the startup scene. What I'm saying is that being more excited about the idea of being an entrepreneur than actually something that you might work on specifically tends to be a very poor strategy for founders. In general, what you want to do is you want to have something that you're exceptional at, that you're really excited about, that is not simply being an entrepreneur. What we found at EF is the people most likely to leave the program before the end without a successful company are the ones who really just wanted to be in startups. But they didn't care what kind of startup. And they didn't care what that meant. And they didn't care what they did. To them, it was just really, really important that they were in a startup. That's a very dangerous place to be. I always joke, or rather the team at EF always jokes, that if you meet a student entrepreneur who has a business card before they have a product, You've met a failed entrepreneur. People get very hung up on the whole idea of being in business, of being in entrepreneurship, as though that in itself is a thing. They forget that being an entrepreneur means having a business. And the business is the most important thing. Not business broadly, but that business, the business that you are starting. So these three things together tend to be good advice for getting a job, even perhaps for getting a job in a startup. You know, if you're a smart generalist, if you're the perfect job candidate, if you're an expert entrepreneur, if you know all about business, they all sound like good things. They are good things if your goal is to get a job. But what I would argue extremely strongly is they're not good ways to become a founder. Again, to clarify, I'm not saying they're disqualifying. I'm not saying if you are any of these things, then you can't start a business. I'm saying these are not the things to optimize for. In fact, what I'm going to talk for most of the time tonight about is things that are much more uh, unusual, that would not make you a good job candidate, but that do make you potentially a good founder. So what are those three things? Well, I think the way of thinking about it in a very general sense 
is that startups are almost impossibly hard. One of my favorite things to say in talks like this is that it's irrational for nearly everyone in this room to start a startup. The expected outcome from starting a startup is pretty good, but that's only because the outliers, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Palantirs, shift the mean up so far. The median outcome is zero. The median outcome, the most likely outcome for you is zero. The only people who should start startups are people who hear that and think, yeah, obviously I would get better than the median app. If you think that you are only an average entrepreneur, then you're basically signing up to failure. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. In other words, even good outcomes, even outcomes that say the, I don't know, 75th percentile, are pretty bad in startups. You might do all right at that level. You might make some money, you might build some product, but you're almost certainly, if you're in the 75th percentile of all founders, you'll almost certainly have less impact in the world, make less money, and be less happy than if you'd just gone to work in a job. And realize that this is the worst marketing spiel ever to start for getting people to start companies. But that's the Nibra, because I don't want to fund average, company, average founders that entrepreneur first. I want to fund the people who believe rationally or otherwise, that they're going to have the extraordinary outcome. I'm talking about this because it introduces the idea of edge. And edge is extremely important, both for you as a founder, when you think about what kind of company you want to start, and for me as an investor, when I think about what kind of people I want to fund. The idea of edge is the idea of saying, what am I uniquely positioned, which kind of company, no, company am I uniquely positioned, to be the best possible founder of. You need to start the kind of company where you are most likely to get an extraordinary outcome. If you start the kind of company where you can get a good outcome, remember that good is not good enough in startups. Instead, you need to be constantly thinking about edge, about how you can stand out from an extraordinarily large crowd on some dimension. And whenever we take people on at EF, whenever we fund people, what we spend most of the first few weeks that they spend with us doing is getting them to think very, very hard about what edge means for them. If you can find an edge, I don't know, those of you who have um, studied um, things, uh, studied gambling as a mathematical concept will be familiar with um, the name of it's called the Kelly, Kelly Criterion, is that what it's called? Where essentially you calculate um, how much you should bet, given rationally, given a certain edge, as in superior knowledge of an outcome. That very much applies to startups. You should really only start startup where you have an edge which will allow you an extraordinary outcome. So if you believe me, if you think that I'm uh, right, that really you should only start startup where you have an extraordinary edge, then really the whole debate about what should you do now to prepare for a career as a founder really comes down to how can you have an edge at the very start of your career? That's a really important question. If you think that it's possible that you might start a company in the next, say, three to five years, the most important thing you can think about is where your edge is going to lie. Where is your unfair advantage, it might be called, going to lie? And we think there are three places where uh, people that start their careers, people who have less experience perhaps than, than some founders, three places where those kinds of people can find an edge. It's worth bearing in mind that if we think back to the three things I said were not going to be helpful, were not great preparations for being a founder, they apply directly to this principle. Remember, if you are a perfect job candidate, that by, almost by definition means that you probably don't have an edge, right? It means that you, if you're going to be a fantastic employee at a bank or a consultancy or a law firm or accountancy, that's kind of because you are a smart generalist. Maybe a very, very, very smart generalist. But almost by definition, you will be less effective than the people who were just two years above you in that job, in that same job. When I joined McKinsey, there were people who were a lot better than me at being that job, simply by virtue of having been that one. I had no edge whatsoever in that job. Maybe two years later I did because I'd learned something and you know, maybe at that point you know, I was able to like, carve out some edge for myself in that job. 
But in general, if you're good in a conventional way, your edge will disappear relative to people with more experience. Okay, enough negativity. So, how do you develop an edge as a student? How can it be that by the time you graduate, you genuinely have an edge such that you are investable? Such that someone like me or some of the people that do similar things to EF could actually say, yeah, this might be really worth the pump. This might be worth the pump. As I said, I think there are three ways. I think the first, and you're going to see, I'm going to back say this word a lot, I think the first is obsession with a problem. If I go back to why I'm so negative about people who are totally obsessed with entrepreneurship, but not with anything else, one of the reasons that's problematic is that really, what a startup is, is a just an applied approach to solving a problem. But very, very few successful companies that can't be said to solve a problem. And so, when you think about what a good startup is, what a good founder is, it's really usually the company that solves the particular problem best. How are you going to be the company? How are you going to be the founder that solves the particular problem best? Well, actually, the best way, the most reliable way to be that founder is to have the deepest understanding of that problem. One of the things that is very, very tempting for first-time founders is to pick a problem to solve that they think they know well, but where actually the reason they think they know that well is because lots of people know it well. I'll give you an example. Probably the most common startup ideas that we get pitched at EF come in one of the following categories. Wouldn't it be great if there was a better way to collaborate uh, on courses at uni? People think they're experts in that because they're at uni. But actually, loads of people are at uni. Unless you have an edge on that problem, unless you've thought harder about the problem of collaboration at uni than any other student, being a student doesn't give you an edge. Second one, wouldn't it be great if there was a better way to track my performance in the gym? This is a classic one. We get pitched this probably somewhere between like five and 10 times a year. It's not a terrible idea on the face of it, but how would you, how would any founder have an edge on that problem? How would you actually be the best possible founder for the gym performance tracking startup? Lots of people think they have an edge because they go to the gym, and not everyone goes to the gym. But lots of people do go to the gym. Is it likely that you actually have an edge in that problem? It's actually extremely unlikely, because it feels like you know a lot about it, but actually if all you do is go to the gym a few times a week, you're not as deeply embedded in that problem as the people who really are really are obsessed. True obsession with a problem really comes down to having an extremely nuanced, sophisticated understanding of the problem, such that people who only know a bit about the problem really frustrate you. If, you, if there is something you're obsessed with so much that you can't stand to talk about it with people who think they know a lot about it but don't, maybe you found your edge. I'm going to give some concrete examples of things we've funded at EF that to us, for example, the people who are obsessed with problems. So last year we funded a company called Code Kingdoms. Uh, Code Kingdoms is, produces an iPad app which uh, helps kids learn to code. Um, kids learning to code is another idea that we get pitched all the time. But in general, we wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. There are tons of people who, because they're programmers, think that they're obsessed with the problem of teaching kids to code. In general, when you say to those people, cool, so how do you know about that problem? Generally, what they're thinking about is their own experience of learning to program. That does not mean that you're obsessed with the problem. So the guy who we funded to do this, Hugh, he was really obsessed with this problem. When he was 15, he built the first version of a game to build uh, his first version of a game to teach kids to code. When he was 17, he started volunteering in a school to teach kids to code. He did that the whole way through uni. He released multiple versions of other games to try and kids to teach kids to code throughout uni. Whenever he had a spare moment, he was looking at other ways of teaching kids to code. He went to educational conferences, which are probably the dullest things on earth, just so he could be exposed to more ways of teaching kids to code. This was before he joined the app. This wasn't during the app. And this is the critical thing. He didn't do that because he sat down and thought, what, is, uh, what startup am I going to create? He was just organically obsessed with that problem. 
It was a genuine problem in the world that he felt this burning desire to solve. He felt he had to solve that problem because he cared about it. And so when you talk to him, when you ask him questions about how kids learn to code, it's almost impossible, as a generalist, and I very much am a generalist when it comes to teaching kids to code, to ask him a question where the complexity of his answer doesn't surprise you. You know, I would say that if you ask me about how to teach, teach kids to code, I could probably bullshit a pretty convincing answer because they're fond of the company in that space. But I'm very rapidly, like the second or third level of questioning, it would become very obvious that I was speaking in general, generalities and I was just making stuff up. If you were to ask Hugh about how kids learn to code, he would come out with anecdotes of particular kids who would describe approaches that have been tried in the past and failed. He would be able to tell you in an extremely detailed way why exactly this problem mattered to him. If there is a subject that you feel like that about, that is a very good sign that you're developing the level of obsession that a company can come out of. Two things to say about this. One, Many people have obsessions that I actually think are extremely strong, extremely powerful, but they don't see them as obsessions that could become startup ideas. That's totally understandable because the world doesn't teach you to think of your obsessions as the seeds of startup ideas. But actually, one thing that we do at EF with everyone who joins, we spend a lot of time trying to understand their obsessions and trying to help them think about how that obsession might be the seed of starting a company. What's really, really interesting, this is the second point, is that if you look at some of the most successful companies of the last 30 or so years, they've come out of obsessions that seemed either trivial or ridiculous or foolish or niche at the time, and they've come on to be big companies. The biggest company in the world by value, Apple, came out of Steve Wozniak's obsession with Something that at the time seemed like dirty or weird or even dangerous. I don't know how many of you have read about the history of Apple and the homebrew computing club, but this was like, in their own words, like a collection of people who self-identified as freaks. You know, they like met in garages and basements and soldered, and you know, like no one would touch this. And yet, if you ever read a, an interview with Steve Wozniak about the start of Apple, it becomes apparent that he was literally obsessed with the problems he was solving to the point that would have exceeded pretty much anyone else in the world. He never for a moment thought of that as, here is a fantastic seed and foundation for a new company. But because that problem became more and more important over time, the fact that he was at the very cutting edge of this problem became extremely important and became the foundation of the company. I'll give you some more examples, because I think this is um, probably the place where students have the biggest edge, and maybe this isn't true at Imperial because I know you all work extremely hard, but students often seem to be able to develop extreme obsessions in areas that are totally unrelated to their studies, that they are able to indulge given uh, that they you know, don't have uh, family commitments, work commitments in quite the same way uh, as people who have graduated. Uh, I realize you all work unbelievably hard in Imperial, so maybe this doesn't apply. But I think one way of thinking about it is that anything that you do as a hobby in your free time and that you feel you've kind of almost fallen down the rabbit hole Alice in Wonderland style into, this could be the foundation of a startup. Um, we, this year we have a company at EF that's, um, that's focused on helping traders manage financial risk. Um, the two founders are like 22 and 23. They've never worked in trading, but they've both been trading kind of with small amounts of their own money for about five years. They're totally obsessed with it. They say, they tell me that when they were at uni, as soon as they finished their studies, they would immediately race to all these forums um, where they would have extremely obscure conversations with other day traders about things that I don't even understand now, even though we funded this company. That's a good rule of thumb, by the way. If you are so obsessed with a topic that you contribute to some forum or subreddit of it that no one else would ever frequent, that probably suggests you're at the right level of obsession to actually start a company in this space. It has two huge advantages. One, these guys, if I started a trading company, I would, I would like to try and solve a very general problem that I kind of assumed exists. 
when these two guys tried to start a trading company, they were attacking a very specific problem that they knew existed because it was their own problem. Not only that, but although they've never been out networking in the trading world, they didn't know traders at big investment banks or hedge funds, they knew all the other people who were on these forums. They weren't creating new accounts to promote their software to a bunch of people who were skeptical and suspicious. They were already parts of that community. They already had access to their customers. In this way, obsessions not only give you access to good problems to solve, but they also give you access to communities of people who will be the first customers for your products. We've seen this not just in trading and in teaching kids to code, but we've seen it in um, drones. We had a great drones company in year one who were building consumer, um, kind of almost like selfie drones before selfies were a thing. Um, we've had people um, who are obsessed with charitable fundraising, who build companies in that space. And what they always have in common is it almost seems like an unhealthy level of obsession compared to everything else in their life when they join us. When I meet someone who can talk for an hour about subjects I know nothing about, that's when I get really excited and get out of my checkpoint. I'm probably there with the point now. Number one, be absolutely obsessed with a particular area or problem, and you have the foundations of a startup idea. Something you can do from the bedroom, from the university, wherever. It's totally accessible right at the start of your career. How to be fundable number one. You'd be pleased to know that how to be fundable number two is extremely similar. The second kind of person that's done extremely well at EF, straight out of university or the very start of their career, are people who aren't actually obsessed with an area. You know, they would never frequent a trading subreddit, but they're obsessed with a way of solving the problem. And usually because of the kind of companies we like to invest in, that means they're obsessed with a piece of technology. The reason I draw a distinction between this, number two, and number one, is that the first type of person knows a problem inside out and doesn't really care how they solve it, they just know they need to solve it. The second kind of person is almost the inverse. They don't care what problem they solve, they just determine that they're going to use this piece of technology to solve it. Uh, a good example this year, I just finished doing about 400 interviews for the next EF Cohort, and like nearly one in three interviews. So, like, well, what do you want to work on at EF? It's like, I want to apply machine learning to something. I was like, wow, maybe, maybe. But you know what? The people who really are obsessed with machine learning, or in other cases with virtual reality, or with blockchain, or with uh, connected devices, What's really interesting about funding them is that if they really genuinely care about this technology, if they are cut, kind of pushing the cutting edge of what's possible in this technology, there's actually a whole host of problems out there that suddenly become, come into play as a founder. I'll give a few examples because maybe this one is a little bit more abstract. I have a guy who came out of Imperial actually last year who um, was totally obsessed with, um, with deep learning, the kind of machine learning. And uh, he was totally, totally unconcerned about what kinds of problems he solved. But all he ever did was read about deep learning. He would like come into the office and I'd be like, oh, hey, what have you been doing? It's like, I found this extraordinary academic paper buried away in you know, some obscure journal and it solves this particular. It's just like, wow, like, this guy is genuinely obsessed with this technology. And what's interesting is that if, you, if your knowledge in that, in that, of that technology is sufficiently advanced, you actually can attack almost any problem with that technology, and a startup can emerge from it. So this guy, uh, he met his co-founder at EF, they're both obsessed with deep learning. They ended up attacking a problem around identifying failure in welds, as in joints, of pipes in construction sites. <coughs> No one in the history of the world has ever woken up and said, Mommy, Mommy, one day I want to solve massive problems in pipe welds at failure detection. That has never happened in the history of the world. Fortunately, it's not necessary for people like that to feel like that about pipe weld failure detection. Because if you're sufficiently interested in an approach to solving a problem, you can be almost completely agnostic about what problem you solve. We've seen this as a surprising amount of EF. We have a guy this year one of my, you shouldn't have favorites, but one of my favorite companies in the current EF cohort, um, they are building uh, virtual reality software to help architects 
So what they do is they, they have a, like a fairly standard um, virtual reality headset, and they can build more or less on the fly 3D worlds of, um, of buildings that are yet to be built straight from the architect's model. More or less, you upload the architect's model and it builds a 3D world that you can walk around in a virtual reality headset. It's incredibly cool. Every time I try it on, I'm just like a little child. I'm giddy with excitement walking around these like houses that don't yet exist. Again, that guy didn't even know that this was a problem for architects. It wouldn't have occurred to him. He was not in the first category. He was not problem obsessive. I imagine we might find someone who came and said, oh my god, do you know how many problems architects have? I've been working in architects' offices every summer the whole time I was at Imperial, and I'm just determined to solve this problem that I've seen every time. We might find someone like that. But that's not how this guy came to us. Instead, this guy was totally obsessed with graphics, computer graphics, um, 3D graphics. He came and he said, I don't really have any idea what I'm going to work on. I have no idea what problem I'm going to solve. But I absolutely know that I want to use 3D graphics. I have to. I've been messing about with them since I was 14. He actually already sold um, some like 3D I can't remember what it was, but he'd already sold some application of this technology online by accident, simply by uploading a YouTube video and then getting like inbound comments from some company. He sold that when he was 17. He was totally obsessed with this technology. And when he joined EF, we helped him find ways of, of using this technology. And you know, he got to know some architects, and it turned out this really was a problem. And hey, now he's got a company that's funded and, and going extremely well. He was totally obsessed with the technology. And you might notice a neat symmetry in category one and category two so far, which is that actually, if you can find someone in category one, someone who's obsessed with a problem, and someone who's in category two, and is obsessed not with a problem, but with a way of solving problems in general, you kind of have a match made in heaven. You have a match made in heaven because you're able to apply that technology to that problem, and suddenly you're really at the edge of what's possible. And then you have an unfair advantage. And that's what we're trying to specialize in at EF, is finding people who have one of those two uh, characteristics and saying, this is going to push you to the cutting edge of what's possible. This gives you a chance of an extraordinary outcome. So they're the main two categories. I think there is a third way, uh, and it's a slightly unusual one, which is be a mental maniac. A lot of the time at EF, we find that founders come to us, people who want to be founders come to us, and they have this intangible quality that is nevertheless extremely compelling. And that's that when you challenge them about what they want to do, they're pretty open about the fact that they don't necessarily have an obsession with a technology or an obsession with a problem. But they nevertheless have this almost sense of predestination that they're just bound to end up changing the world and making a dent the universe. That they have this sense that actually they were born to build something huge. The trouble is lots of people believe this and they're wrong. And the hard thing is how to find the people who believe this and are right. Unfortunately, having interviewed thousands of these people over the last three years, I think we're starting to see some of the common characteristics. But let me explain what those characteristics are by way of a brief digression. If you are, as you probably are, in your kind of early to mid to maybe late 20s, and you're wondering what to do with your life, and you're extremely ambitious, I'm assuming that most of you are at least mildly ambitious, and I'm guessing that some of you are extremely ambitious, and I'm guessing that some of you, when you saw the word megalomania, kind of maybe didn't want to like have any visual cue that you uh, maybe put yourself in that category, but inside, you're like, yeah, well, you know. Probably I'm going to change the world at some level at some point in time. And you're laughing because it's just like, well, you know, it's slightly embarrassing. Certainly in Britain, none of us would ever want to admit to being so ambitious that we change the world. But there's probably some of you who's like, yeah, I'm in that category. What's probably the most important fact for your entire career, if you are in this category, is that for the first time in human history, and I'm not exaggerating, for the first time in human history, it's been possible to reach a billion people with a product that you can build in your bedroom. That's literally never been true before in the history of humanity. And actually, that fact is so important and so powerful that it should be pretty much, it should be 
more or less def all defining, completely definitional for you as you think about what to do with your life. If you imagine that if you were born in the 16th century and you didn't happen to be born heir to a throne or heir to some great portion of land somewhere in the countryside, you were kind of screwed. There was not very much that you could do if you happened to be born into the 16th century peasantry. It didn't actually matter whether you were a megalomaniac because there was just not any access to tools to help you scale your impact. You could maybe be the best, most productive farmer in your village, but you couldn't be much more than that because there just weren't tools of scale, there weren't tools of leverage. <coughs> this is not quite true though, because a very, very, very small number of people found ways to use the infrastructure at the time to massively scale their impact. Um, you're going to have to let me have a very brief medieval history digression. So, um, has anyone ever been to Hampton Court Palace? Very good. Yes, one person has been to Hampton Court Palace. Okay, this is going to work less well than I anticipated. Hampton Court Palace is this massive palace in southwest, uh, southeast London. Southwest London, south London somewhere. It's absolutely enormous. It's bigger than Buckingham Palace. It's absolutely vast. And it was built in the early 16th century by this guy called Cardinal Wolsey who was actually born the son of a butcher in Ipswich. And he was probably the single most successful person of his era if you measure where he ended up from where he was born. And the reason this matters is because he found the one way of scaling your impact in the 16th century, which is he became a priest. I would not recommend this to any of you now. <laughs> But actually, for Cardinal Woolsey, it really worked because he became a priest and he got pretty good and well known as being a pretty good priest. And then he was promoted to a bishop and then became Archbishop of York and then he was making God And you don't need to worry about any of this except that he ruthlessly optimized for the one institution that had scale beyond your immediate locality. The church in the 16th century was pretty much, unless you were born into the aristocracy, was the one way to scale your impact. Fast forward 300 years, 250 years, and there's a guy who becomes the emperor of Europe, Napoleon. He is like the classic megalomaniac. When people hear megalomaniac, some people think of Napoleon. Again, don't worry, it won't be a long digression into history. But Napoleon was born into, I think he was like the seventh or fifth, some number child out of many, in a very ordinary family in Corsica, which was like in the middle of nowhere. I mean, Corsica's like an island in the Mediterranean. The chances of this guy being the emperor of Europe were infinitesimally small. But what was interesting was that Napoleon found the one institution, really, that would allow him to scale his impact in the 17th, in the 18th and 19th century. And for him, at that time, it was the army. You know, the army was a way of, of leveraging who you were beyond who you were. He was able to command men, and therefore he had power in much a way that Wolseley was able to command the church. You may think, what the hell is this guy talking about? But it's really crucial because Napoleon was a megalomaniac and he was drawn to the one institution that allowed him to scale his impact. Fast forward another hundred years, look at people who became the great financiers of the 20th century. People who found that finance actually was an extraordinary institution for scaling your impact because you could sit in an office in London or in New York, like the original JP Morgan, um, for example, and he found he was able to scale his impact through moving money. Fast forward again 100 years to where we are now, 2015. If you are Napoleon or Dickie Morgan or um, Cardinal Wolseley sitting here today, to me it is extraordinarily obvious that the institution that will give you the most ability to scale your impact is to build technology. Mark Zuckerberg is about an embarrassingly small number of weeks older than me. He's one of the most powerful people in the world. And the reason he's one of the most powerful people in the world is that he was immediately drawn to the most important way of our generation of scaling your impact. This really matters because if you are a mental agent, if you are the sort of person that really wants to make a huge difference, that you're not going to be content to just wind your way up a corporate ladder to just kind of do really well in your job, you're going to have to find tools that allow you leverage. You can't just have an impact on the room that you're in, you need to find ways of reaching the world. And for me, it's incredibly obvious, but much misunderstood, that technology, being part of uh, organizations, institutions that use technology to scale impact, is the way to be a megalomaniac in the 21st century. And actually, you can develop 
a lot of the things that you need as an open handicap while you're still at university. You can start to think about the idea of scale, what it means to scale yourself. If you care about having impact in the world, you need to think about what it is going to require for you to reach beyond the confines of what it's possible to do. We've seen this on a lot at EF. My favorite kind of interview in the final round at EF is to sit down and suddenly realize that the guy actually thinks he's Napoleon. Um, albeit transplanted a few hundred years in, in several ways. Once I see someone with extraordinary ambition, who has thought hard about what it means to scale their impact, that de-risks a huge amount of our investment. Because I no longer have to worry, really, about the idea or the team. I'm really just making a bet on this person. This person's ambition is going to drive them so far that actually just having a little bit of a chunk of their company is going to take us far, even if it takes them a while to figure it out. OK, so far, three ways to really, really be impressive, be fundable by the time you leave university. You might be thinking, hmm, so far so good, but what the hell does that all mean? Well, that's why I have 3.5. I think the hardest thing about all this is maybe you are obsessed with a problem. Maybe you are obsessed with the technology. Maybe you do think of Napoleon when you're a megalomaniac. But be able to prove it. And this actually, I suppose, is maybe to the extent that this is meant to be providing advice, Maybe the most useful piece of advice. We meet so many people, I literally speak to hundreds of people each year who want to do EF or want to start a business in another way, and they, I tell them about what we look for, I tell them about what other investors look for, I tell them about what it requires to succeed, and they always tell me that they have those characteristics. And the next thing I always ask is for evidence of those characteristics. And it amazes me how few people have thought about how to evidence the fact that they either are an obsessive or a megalomaniac. And what I would think about if I were you is how can you use the time at uni to start to actually build evidence that proves you are uh, someone who can develop an edge, someone who can have an unfair advantage. It's very, very hard to take uh, the profession that you are definitely in one of these categories seriously uh, without some evidence. So for the last few minutes of my talk, I just wanted to say about what counts as evidence. What does it mean to be able to demonstrate that you are fundable, that you have the potential to have extraordinary outcomes? Well, we look really for, for a few things at EF, and I think uh, when I look at these investors that I know in startups, uh, I see that we all really look for these things. The first thing is we look for things that people have actually built. It's all very well to be an expert or an obsessive in theory, but being one in practice is much more difficult. When I say built, I mean that in the broadest possible sense. Uh, sometimes, obviously, here where you really like investing in software and in hardware, so if you build software or hardware, that's great. If you can actually show me something you've built, that's fantastic. But actually, built can be interpreted extremely broadly. A fantastic way to evidence that you fall into one of these categories to show me something that exists because you did it, it wouldn't exist if you hadn't. Show me an organization that exists, a series of events that exists, you know, uh, a group of people that exists, as I said, a piece of software, a piece of technology. Show me something that exists because you did it, and without you it wouldn't have happened. That's an extraordinarily compelling piece of evidence. The second thing is, show me something that you've thought about. Often people claim to be experts in problems or say they're obsessed, and yet they can't really tell me anything that they've ever thought that isn't kind of obvious in that area. Something that I find incredibly compelling when candidates come to us, and I know I've heard this from uh, other investors who invest bigger amounts further up the value chain, is it's extremely, uh, it's extremely uh, compelling when someone has actually got a blog or has written about the subject that they claim to be interested in. What we're really looking for, and what all investors are looking for, as I say, is someone who's just that little bit better, that little bit more obsessed, has that little bit more of an edge. And let's do that. Let's write about it. Tell the world. Tell the world about what you know that other people know. It's an extremely compelling way of demonstrating it. And the final thing is tell us something extraordinary that you've done that you really think that no one else could do. Very few people seem to uh, very few people seem to create opportunities for themselves to do that. 
So I suppose the final way of being able to prove it is if you claim that you're a megalomaniac, which is kind of the easiest one of these things to claim, but the hardest to prove, you kind of need to set yourself some extraordinary challenges in order to show you're capable of something that most people are not. Very, very often, uh, you know, people claim that they will demonstrate how extraordinary they are once they have a chance to prove it, but of course until now they've not had a chance. And yet when I look again at the most successful founders we've had at the app, they've never been content with the standard structure of challenges that uni or jobs throw their way. They've always set themselves goals that far surpass what is required of them by a teacher or a professor or a boss. This is one of the most compelling things of all. If you can show me something that you achieved and did because you really wanted to, not because someone forced you to, that is truly extraordinary as well. So to recap, I've talked for a long time. I'm going to stop. Very often, people think that if you want to be a great entrepreneur, that looks like being a great employee. I really don't think that's true. You don't need the perfect CV. You don't need to be a well-rounded candidate.